Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization. Can Vegeta kill Superman and Batman at the same time? Yes, the answer is yes. If you disagree with that, it's okay to be wrong. We all come around eventually. Folks, here's the deal. We'd love to talk Dragon Ball Z for a long time, but instead we're gonna talk about the stimulus to fatigue ratio. I have a lot of videos and a lot of writing all over the internet about this. This is a more quick video kind of like a user's guide, simple, straightforward stuff to figure out what the stimulus to fatigue ratio is and how you can best use it to enhance your gains in hypertrophy in the gym. Let's get right into it. So today we're gonna talk about basically having specific goals in growth training to make sure that they're lined up accurately. We're gonna talk about how to estimate the stimulus of muscle growth when you're training right, because directly measuring it requires muscle biopsy and all this other crazy stuff you're never gonna do. We're gonna talk about estimating fatigue. How much does training beat you up? We're gonna talk about the stimulus to fatigue ratio itself and how it folds out of that. And we're gonna talk about exercise selection and technique and how they can change the stimulus to fatigue ratio. And lastly, about how you can personalize your own training to get the most out of it. So in growth training, in training for hypertrophy for muscle size, our goal with pretty much every exercise is to stimulate the target muscles to grow. That's it, we just wanna turn on the cellular growth pathways in the target muscles and that's exactly why we train when we're training for growth. It's not a mystery, right? Now, that means that when you do an exercise, especially as you get to be an intermediate and advanced level lifter, you're not so much doing the exercise to just move the weight or just get it done, you're doing the exercise to actually target a specific muscle or muscles, usually one muscle is really the main focus per exercise to get it to grow. And that probably means that muscle should somehow feel being targeted, okay? So you want as much stimulus as possible going to the target muscle, but also you want as little fatigue as possible. What is fatigue? Fundamentally, it's kind of two things in hypertrophy training. You get a high degree of fatigue if your joints and connective tissues are bothered a lot by a certain method of training or a certain exercise, right? You're doing squats, your quads feel great, feel like they're getting a great stimulus, but your knees hurt and they hurt more and they hurt more and they hurt more. Not the greatest thing in the world, certainly not very sustainable for a long time, even if you get some short-term growth. Fatigue can also be systemic. Systemic fatigue comes from a lot of places and has a lot of sources, but what it does is it impedes your ability to train hard later, not just for the local muscle, but for the rest of your body as well. And a lot of times, systemic fatigue stems from exercises that take a lot of effort to do for what you get out of it, especially psychological effort. And we'll get to that in a bit. So what you wanna do is maximize stimulus and minimize fatigue in essentially every exercise and every method of training that you do, because that will bring you the best results. Just maxing stimulus is great, but then it doesn't concern itself with the fatigue and it becomes unsustainable. Just minimizing fatigue is great if you wanna never accumulate any fatigue, but you may never grow, right? So we need both high stimulus and as low fatigue as possible. How do we estimate these things in the real world? Because at the end of the day, yeah, theoretically, good clap, slow clap, Professor Mike, that's nice. But it, how do we actually in the gym figure these things out? It turns out we have some good hints. So. Estimating the stimulus, there are roughly three proxy measurements we can use to guess pretty decently that an execution of a certain exercise in a certain way, a certain amount of or type of training has a pretty decent hypertrophy stimulus to the target muscle. The, there's three boxes basically, and the more you boxes you check off, and the more bold the checks are, the more clearly happening these things are, the more likely it is that you're causing not just muscle growth at all, but higher degrees of muscle growth per any unit of doing that kind of training. So number one, and these are not in order of importance, we need all three, ideally all of them, but a few uh, is a good start. Number one, mind-muscle connection. We don't just mean like, oh yeah, I have a bicep, I can feel it moving. That's not a mind-muscle connection in the realm of hypertrophy training. In hypertrophy training, the mind-muscle connection is either you perceive a ton of tension throughput through the target muscle, or you have a high degree of lactate burn in the target muscle. The first one happens usually with the heavier loading ranges, sets of five to 15, and then the burn happens usually in the 15 to 30 rep range, but sometimes in that 10 to 20 range, you can get a good degree of both. Here's the deal. 
If you perceive, for example, you're training biceps and you perceive a high degree of tension through your biceps as you're curling, that's a good sign. That means you're using your bicep. If your bicep is generating tension, that is a huge part of what causes hypertrophy. And if your bicep for high reps is generating a ton of lactic acid, that means that it's being used. And that's also a good thing. It's like a lactic acid accumulation, sort of a measurement of how much tension you've accumulated over time, which is a really high rep effort. Both are very good. Where does this leave us? Well, if you're getting a lot of tension and you're getting a lot of burn, that's probably a good sign. But the opposite is also true. If you don't really feel much tension or much burn in the target muscle, it might be a poor stimulus. For example, let's say you're doing curls in a new way one of your buddies showed you and you're feeling tons of tension in your forearms and even like in your front delts and not a ton in your bicep. And when you get close to failure for high reps, your forearms are on fire. Your front delts are on fire, but your biceps aren't burning that's probably not a good sign. So if your friend is like, hey, what do you think? Great bicep exercise? You can be like, yeah, you know, definitely a great forearm exercise, maybe even front delt exercise. I can't be confident that it's a great bicep exercise, no matter how it looks biomechanically. Because at a technical level, if you don't feel a ton of tension through something, maybe you're onto something, maybe not. Sometimes you can't perceive tension super well, but it's still being generated. But if you don't get a super high burn in something, for high reps and something else has a burn, that something else is probably closer to its own muscular failure. Like your forearms are closer to their muscular failure than biceps. So when you stop the set, you could have stopped at forearm failure. Like your forearms just can't work anymore to grip and to do their own flexion. But your biceps, the local actual bicep muscle might be three or five reps away from failure. It was just beginning its hard work that would be stimulative and thus it doesn't get a good show. So we want as much of a burn and as much tension perception as possible. That's number one. Number two, the pump. It's very good if an exercise for a muscle group gives you a good, robust pump with just a few sets. That's usually a good sign. And this is nothing like rocket science. You guys know this. You do some kind of new chest dumbbell press exercise and two sets in, you're like, holy crap, my chest is blowing up. That's really just not a bad thing. Remember, the pump itself at a mechanistic level probably causes hypertrophy. And it's a symptom of the fact that you've been really generating a ton of tension for lots of reps and generating metabolites. All those cause hypertrophy and they also cause the pump. Having a pump is great. That's a good thing to check off and the opposite is true as well. If you don't have a big pump after doing lots of sets of an exercise eh, or a different technique, it just might not be the greatest exercise in the world. Like if someone's like, bro, I got this chest exercise, it's going to annihilate you. Five sets later, they're like, you pumped up. You're like, not, not really, right? Or if there's a pump in your biceps and your front delts, but not in your pecs, maybe the chest isn't the biggest target of that exercise, right? Last one is muscle disruption. So, an exercise that is robustly stimulative should leave the target muscle feeling some combination of the following. Weaker, right? much weaker usually after numerous working sets, not working properly. Right? The lunges hit your glutes like crazy and if you haven't done lunges for a while, you try your second or third set of lunges, your glutes start to misfire and start to cramp. You're like, holy crap, something's going on. Or if you have a huge pump in your chest after a cable fly drop set, you, you flex your pecs. You're like, I can't even feel my pecs anymore. Like there's something, they're hugely pumped, but also just like, this is, I'm totally out of touch. Like, do I even have pecs anymore? Like that's, something probably happened to them. And that something is probably a lot of tension throughput metabolites and pump, all of which are really, really good. And there can be some soreness. It can be soreness just a couple of hours after they feel sort of tight and stiff. It can be delayed onset soreness. It can take a couple of days to heal. Anything in between isn't so much good or bad. It's a sign that you probably did something productive with the muscle. Now, the soreness part especially, there can be too much of a good thing. Too much stimulus creates way too much damage and makes you sore for a real long time. So soreness isn't like as much of it as we can get, but I'll put it to you this way. And this is the, the red text here. The, the sort of corollary of this, the opposite is if your muscles don't feel affected by the training, for example, you did like 10 sets of chest and you got no soreness at all, man, maybe that exercise or your nutritional status or your grips or whatever, your technique is just not the most hypertrophic thing in the world. But if you do like three sets of stiff legged deadlift and you get sore for a week and a half, that's probably too much, but look, 99 problems, but a stimulus is not one of them. Clearly, you're doing some stuff to your hamstrings. It's just easier to go and say, okay, great, I figured out a great exercise. Let me do half of the working sets and be super out of my way rather than doing like six sets of something and being like, I guess nothing happened. So 
Another way to measure this is like, uh, it's super easy for something like legs. If you do a really crazy quad workout, a really hard quad workout, something you think is stimulative, and you could just hop, skip out of the gym afterwards. Did you really train legs though? Maybe, is it stimulative? Here, you did some work, I'm sure it's somewhat stimulative, but a really, really good leg workout, one that is maximally stimulative or just very stimulative, you're gonna feel interesting walking around, walking downstairs is gonna feel funny, you might be crampy, you might feel weak. Those are generally things that are good, that there can be too much of a good thing, but if you don't have them at all and you're not making progress in the gym, you sort of know why, and that's too little stimulus. So these are three stimulus check marks, right? Mind-muscle connection, tension feeling in the muscle, burn feeling in the muscle. Get a pump from not a ton of work or some reason of work, and your muscle gets messed up both in its physical abilities, in its perceptive abilities, and probably, or rather its perception of like something's wrong, it can be crampy, and then it potentially can develop some kind of soreness. Those are all, if they're happening, if all three are happening, Again, 99 problems, but stimulus is not one of them. You're probably, you could be, maybe you're not training frequently enough. Maybe you're not eating well, but the session itself is hard and it's probably hard enough to grow. If you're getting two out of the three, yeah, you're probably doing just fine. You'll probably grow, but maybe not optimally. If you're getting one out of the three, I as a betting man wouldn't bet that you're growing muscle, but you could be, you could prove me wrong. If you're getting zero out of the three, gee, like you're gonna grow muscle by sheer accident at that point, if at all, and I wouldn't bet on it. So we want as much of these things, generally speaking, the more the better, uh, unless we're talking about soreness. And then some is definitely better than none because you at least know what's going on. You're doing something to the muscle. But stimulus is not enough. Let's talk about fatigue. So. What's the deal with fatigue? We have three, just to keep it simple, three proxy stimuli, or sorry, three proxies, measurements in the gym, in the real world of fatigue. First one is joint and connective tissue fatigue. So after training, during training and after training, your joints involved in the muscle training should feel pretty good. Okay, so how do you score poorly on joint and connective tissue fatigue? You do like a set of Smith machine incline bench and every time your elbows are like, ow, 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 ow. Three sets later, you're like, uh, uh, and training partner's like, set four, you're like, nope, I'm done for the week. I can't even properly please myself anymore if you catch my drift, because the elbow has to bend usually, unless, anyway. Here's the deal, folks. If your joints are killing you during an exercise, that's usually not a good thing, right? Maybe you can make some adjustments, maybe some other things can change, but generally speaking, that means it's a high degree of fatigue. And it doesn't just have to be during, it can be after. You could feel hunky-dory doing hack squats, because you're warmed up and you're psyched up. And when you're warmed up and psyched up, actually your perception of pain decreases. That's on purpose. It's part of the fight or flight response. So, but like a day later or 12 hours later, your knees could be real bad. Like, oh my God, holy shit, the hack squats really messed me up. That's not necessarily a great thing. If you can find a way to hack squat or find another exercise that doesn't do that to your knees, that's better, right? So if an exercise wrecks your joints and connective tissues, it probably is creating high fatigue, which is not a good thing, right? Next one is rating of perceived exertion. This one's a little tough, it's a little nuanced. For the stimulus that you're getting, the easier the exercise is, the better. And I have an interesting illustration from uh, geared powerlifting, which almost nobody does anymore, but bear with me. In geared powerlifting, you put on a bench press shirt, for example, and you touch to a couple of boards or something like that, it takes an unbelievable amount of effort to unrack like 700 pounds and touch to like a two board, okay? It takes everything in you to psych up because unless you're like remembering terrible trauma from your childhood, the bar doesn't even come off the rack. You gotta try it, like, like that grit. You do a set of three and a racket, okay? Question, how hard did you have to try? Holy crap, you had to wake up demons. Okay, how much of a hypertrophy stimulus did you get? I mean, did you get a pump? No. Did you perceive tension in the target muscle? Maybe, but like really you were just thinking about survival, right? Do you, do you get any kind of soreness in the muscle, like a deep soreness a day later? No, you just usually get joint soreness because such a small range of motion with such a heavy amount of weight. So at the end of the day, the rating of perceived exertion was massive. The return was really small. So the RPE, the higher it is, the worse. We're not saying you don't try in training. Of course you try. But if you find techniques and exercises on which for how much you try, you get a huge stimulus, that's great, right? Putting another way, if you can just coast through a session and still get messed up, holy crap. You guys ever traveled somewhere to another gym or your gym ordered a new grip attachment or something like that, or you figured out a new exercise, you get on a hack squat machine and you're doing like three plates, usually you would do four or five, and with three plates, you're like, oh my God, my quads, and there's a huge pump going on, and tons of metabolites, you're like, 
This is the easiest pump I've ever gotten. That's what we mean by RPE. Stimulus is awesome, but you're just not trying that hard. Listen, you can always try harder. And when you try harder on these exercises, you get an even better response. But remember, there's only so much psychological effort you physically have to give over the course of a set, a session, and a whole week, and even a whole month of training. So if your training is so awesome that it requires you a little bit of psychological uh, sort of amping up, a little bit of your sort of burning your psychological fuel to get good training, but you can always do more, but like we'll take the easier training if it's possible. We're not saying choose the easy movements. We're saying choose the easier movements that still give you a good result. So there's something to be there. And if there's a movement that requires you to just get crazy in your own head, move heaven and earth, and you honestly can't say it's growing muscle, why in God's name are you doing it? Maybe you should change the movement, change the technique, so on and so forth. Lastly, there is strength decline in unused muscles. Real good measure of systemic fatigue. So the rating of perceived exertion, the higher it is, sort of the worse if you're not getting a good stimulus. That is a proxy for what causes systemic fatigue. The strength decline in unused muscles is our, our third index of fatigue. That's what sort of measures how much systemic fatigue you have. What does that mean? If you do a crazy, crazy workout of deadlifts, and then afterwards you go and do overhead tricep extensions, how are you gonna hit a PR on triceps? No, you're gonna be half dead. You're gonna lift like 60% of usual weight reps and sets and be like, oh my God. And someone's gonna be like, you're really hitting your triceps, right? You're like, I don't think so, man. My soul is done. I can't even push hard against the bar. I just need to get out of here. On the other hand, if you did a whole bunch of barbell bent rows, maybe a similar stimulus for many parts of the back that, that the deadlift has, but afterwards, can you do overhead tricep extensions, which involve basically none of the same muscles? Well, yeah. And you could probably hit a good PR on it too and feel just fine. So if an exercise or a training method toasts you like your whole body, it's gonna really interfere with other muscles growing and that's not a great thing. If an exercise toasts one specific part that you want it to toast and leaves everything else the hell alone for the most part, that's awesome because there's not as much spillover of fatigue into the system and that way you can continue to train other muscles productively. So an ideal fatigue exercise, just in the fatigue scale, not the stimulus scale, is one that beats up your joints and connective tissues either not at all or very little, it is not very difficult to pull off and you don't have to move heaven and earth with your mind to try to do it. And it leaves you pretty fresh for all the other muscles you wanna train. Now, clearly it's gonna be messing up that target muscle for sure, but it's gonna leave everything else alone. If we combine that with a, an exercise or if we take an exercise which has all of those features, but also one which has a high degree of stimulus, holy crap, are we onto something really, really good. So. That's something really, really good is the SFR, the stimulus to fatigue ratio. It's probably the most important variable in exercise selection for hypertrophy training and maybe just exercise selection for everything. Here's the thing, the higher the stimulus and the lower the fatigue, the better, okay? For example, if your stimulus is low and fatigue is really high, that sucks. Good example is doing quarter squats for quads. Quarter squats, you use like 700 pounds and it crushes your spine, rounds your back, it hurts your hips, it hurts your knees. It's super hard to psych up for because the bar won't move unless you like really lose your mind. And what do you get out of it? Someone's like, hey, you quarter squatted 700 for five. You're like, yep, I'm the man. Like, okay, did you feel the tension in your quads? No, no, I just felt it in my knees and soul, okay? Did you get a burn in your quads? No. How's your quad pump? I don't have one, really. Okay, so far, so bad right? And then a day later, be like, do your quads really sore? Not really. Back in the day, I was like 19 years old. I did like a set of like nine with 685 or something like that in the eighth squat. Mega fucking stupid, okay? Out of pin, like racks, out of pins and everything. I was so proud of myself because I was fucking 19 years old and I wasn't a very smart 19 year old. So I was like, man, I didn't know anything about training. I was like, man, that's going to be a great stimulus. And I still remember that to this day, I was expecting my quads to really get sore because they had before from other training that was more full range of motion, better exercise selection. And the next day, it was the only time in my life this actually happened to me, my knee joints were physically sore and nothing else. My quads were untouched. My knees were sore. I was like, hmm, you know, like hamster running the wheel in that brain, like maybe I'm an idiot, right? Not a good thing. Not a good thing, okay? So quarter squats are a terrible example and a lot of partial range of move, motion exercises, same idea. Not great stimulus, super high fatigue, bad, bad deal, right? 
What if fatigue is pretty high, but the stimulus is also very high? That's actually pretty decent. And sometimes if the stimulus, the raw stimulus we call it, just the stimulus itself, if that's really high, you can justify that to break plateaus and put on slabs of muscle, especially if you can take a lot of fatigue. You're a beginner, you have a lot of time, your recovery is really good. So something like uh, deep high bar squats. Nobody's gonna tell you squats don't mess you up, right? They could be okay for your joints, but they really take a lot of effort and they cause a lot of systemic fatigue. Um, but the stimulus is crazy, right? So there's, you know, in the quarter squats, the fatigue's like this, the stimulus is like this, total shit. In the full depth squat, the fatigue's probably less, but the stimulus is up here. So that's, that's really, really good. Then we can have another situation where both sort of come down, which is also okay. It's just usually not as time efficient. So that's not a very high stimulus, but fatigue is also very low for me for a long time. And this is sort of changing because I'm changing my technique a little bit. But, and this is just an example for me. This is not dogma at all. Uh, you have other exercises I'm sure that affects you. Because for me, it's been cable rows for a long time. I get on a cable row, I do stuff. I do the cable row. You guys have seen my videos. I do really good technique, I think, on everything, full range of motion and all that shit. And I still feel a thing. And I could do like six sets of cable rows back in the day and I'm just like, ah. and someone's like, you're back pumped. I'm like, no, like it's a hard exercise. I'm like, no, <laughs> I can do this in my sleep and it just doesn't do anything, right? This is the worst thing in the world. Because the worst thing in the world is really high fatigue, like quarter squats and shitty stimulus. This is like the stimulus is shitty, but the fatigue is also really low. So it's like, you know, just not super time efficient. It's definitely better to have a high fatigue and high stimulus because there's something justifying it, right? Than a low of both, but the high fatigue and low stimulus, that's the worst one of all. What's the best one of all, duh, low fatigue, super high stimulus, so that's awesome. For me, for example, full range of motion pull-ups, even assisted pull-ups for sets of like 10 to 15 reps on a good assisted pull-up machine where you can pull really high and then control the eccentric on the way down, oh my God, it tears my lats into bits and I feel so golden afterwards. I am tired at all. I could do another whole back workout after that. Huge pump, huge soreness, huge everything. It doesn't beat up my joints. I don't even have to try that hard. It's awesome. If you have exercises that are more like that, that leave you feeling very stimulated, but with very low fatigue, those are the ones to choose more often than not. Which brings us to this next slide on exercise selection and technique. When choosing exercises to do, Choose the higher SFR ones. How do you know which ones are higher SFR? Folks have asked me, is there a list of high SFR exercises? No, because it's entirely individual. It's what you get a pump from, what you get muscle disruption from, what you perceive tension from, and what affects your joints in the best possible or least bad possible way. Not me, there's tons of differences, so there's no gold standard, you just have to try it. I know, that sucks, but you're in the gym anyway doing stuff, and you like to do different exercises, so every few months or every few weeks when you change exercises, note how stimulative the exercise is, Note how fatiguing it is and sort of keep a, back, a backlog in your mind. Sometimes you can write the stuff down too, but honestly, you're gonna know, especially if you like training and you do it pretty often, you're gonna know what messes you up really well without taxing your joints and being the hardest thing in the world to do. And you're gonna know what it does the opposite of that, which is a shitty exercise, which you probably won't do for long. So definitely make a note of this for yourself. And the more stimulus you get and the less fatigue, so first of all, highest of our exercises is great because they just stimulate you more right? But there's another golden nugget. By stimulating a ton and not adding a lot of fatigue, if you have the time, remember your biggest cap as an advanced lifter on how much you can train is going to be your fatigue hits your MRV, maximum recovery volume, and you can't do any more training. You have to deload. If your stimulus is really high from an exercise, but your fatigue is really low, yes, you can stop and that's great. And you got a great stimulus. Great. But if you have the time and the energy, so on and so forth, you can do even more sets of that exercise that session or spread over more sessions and so on and so forth. And you can raise the stimulus really high. Now the fatigue will start to creep up, but once the fatigue hits the top, hits your MRV, your stimulus is huge. So not only can you get a great workout, you can fit in a doubly great more working out into the same fatigue area under the curve. Awesome, amazing right? It's like um, eating a, a super, it's like eating potato chips. Not only do chips taste great, but they don't fill you up at all. So you can keep having great taste and keep eating two bags of shit. It's really bad for you as far as weight gain. But if you want as much food pleasure as possible, you're not going to broccoli. You know, broccoli, first of all, each piece doesn't taste great. And second of all, three pieces later, you're full, right? This is like potato chips, the stimulus to fatigue ratio style or like a Credible taste per unit, but also you can double and double and double and triple and slowly you get full, slowly the fatigue builds up. Same kind of idea, right? Now, 
when you're doing an exercise, so it's not just about choosing do exercise. You're like, all right, hack squats are great SFR for me, leg press is not so much. Maybe, totally, okay, so maybe I'm a hack squat a little bit more than your leg press, but per exercise, you can fine tune your stimulus to fatigue ratio increase it by fine tuning your technique. What does that look like? It looks like a bunch of stuff. For example, you can alter your grip width, bench like this, bench like this, bench like that. You can alter grip direction on pull downs. Do you grab like this? Do you grab underhand? Do you grab overhand? Do you grab one of those weird like sort of neutral ones or the ones that rotate, right? Those different grips and positions can absolutely change the stimulus to fatigue ratio. You should be experimenting with them to find the ones that get you the best. Now remember, there's not usually like one correct answer. You'll have like three or four variations of an exercise that are awesome, and then three or four variations that are like, eh, and then three or four that are like, no bueno. Just stick to mostly those three or four that are awesome. That's it, that's uh, super, super easy. Another one is stance position, uh, width and foot direction. Do you put your feet like this on the leg press? Do you put them like that? Do you put them like that? Do you put them up on the platform, down on the platform, so on and so forth? All of that stuff is very personal. And there's some general recommendations. If you watch our technique videos on here, you'll see those. But generally speaking, you know, there's a lot of room for individual adjustment to see which one produces the most tension in your quads, for example, produces the biggest burn, and so on and so forth, while minimizing joint pain or joint discomfort, so on and so forth, right? Range of motion. Sometimes, if you, for example, do flies and your range of motion is here, like you don't get a big pump, a big stretch, and nothing happens, like, I don't know, my muscle connection sucks. Then you get the bright idea to go so deep that you're essentially unlocking, you're locking out your elbows at the bottom, and it's just all biceps. And you're like, okay, that's not chest. So range of motion could be too low, and can be too high, but finally you get something nice in the middle, and you, it's all pecs. Beautiful, right? So range of motion can also be tailored to maximize stimulus to fatigue ratio. Movement of the bar, right? Uh, some exercises you pull up, some exercises you pull up and back. Deadlifts are a good example. Upright rows, upright rows, do you pull this way or do you pull with your elbows back? Well, who knows which one has the higher stimulus to fatigue ratio? Cadence, right? Some exercises you could think suck, but when you slow down the reps, they feel super great. You're like, man, tricep push down the blow. And I see you doing them, you're doing this crap. All right, but all of a sudden you take three seconds on the eccentric, lock, three seconds on the eccentric, lock, and after a set close to failure, you're like, oh my God, my triceps and my elbows feel great. Awesome. It could also work the other way around. Some exercises you're doing too slow, you don't really feel it, you really put on the pump and go a little faster and all of a sudden it works super great. So there's tons and many, many others of these to use in your own training to experiment with so you can individualize. At the end of the day, this goes to personalize your own training and that for your clients as well to make it as good as possible. We made the exercise technique videos that are on every week on RP and they will be for a while on the YouTube. We made these technique videos to help you, right? And the thing is the guidelines apply to a bunch of people but they don't apply to everyone, okay? Watch these videos and take from them what you can, general ideas and suggestions, but you gotta personalize the rest, right? If a technique that I, for example, didn't illustrate in the video, but you change it a little bit, if that technique is stimulative for you, it is low fatiguing for you, then it's correct for you, do it. People ask me like, should I do ladder raises like this or like that or like that? And I'm like, which one do you feel in your side delts the most and which one hurts your shoulders the least? They're like this one, I'm like, there's your answer, right? It's not rocket science, but it requires a lot of perception and requires you not just to be a dumb animal doing shit, but perceiving what's actually going on. And it's not super complicated stuff, it just takes a little bit of diligence, right? Be open-minded and you can change as your body adapts and changes. For example, you used to love Smith Machine close grip inclines, but your chest got bigger, your front delts got bigger, even your traps got bigger, and now you feel too bound up, you might have to open up the grip a little bit and then it feels good again. Don't assume that the same technique is always gonna be the best for you. Techniques also get stale, so sometimes you trade off a technique just because you've been using it for a long time. As you use the same technique for a long time, especially if you use it too much, same exercise too, the stimulus tends to sort of decline and the fatigue tends to go up. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio tends to fall off, which is a natural idea of why variation is a very, very good thing. For more details, we have more advanced videos on the subject. They're gonna be coming on YouTube. They're currently on RP Plus as of the writing of this video. RP Plus is also currently free, so go sign up for that. Folks, no dogma. Take as much out of this as you can, nothing more. All we're concerned with is your results. Folks, 
Catch you later. And if you are a big Batman and Superman fan, honestly, so am I. But Vegeta is king.